again the magic circle, observatory, temple, aligned with the rising of the sun and the turning of the heavens. Now make a quantum leap to Robert Goddard, America's rocket pioneer, Yankee dreamer. They laughed and called him the moon man, but he went ahead on his own. He invented and launched the world's first liquid propellant rockets which achieved an altitude of 2,000 feet by the year 1930, the same year in which the astronauts who would set foot on the moon were born. Now, then another time leap to that memorable July day in 1969 when Armstrong and Aldrin descended to an alien surface in Lunar Module Eagle while Collins remained in orbit 45 miles above them, and the world held its breath. 40 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. Four forward, four forward, drifting to the right a little. Head. Hey. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. The dawning of a new age the exploration of outer space. But for the six people who began as strangers more than 20 years ago, viewing the moonshot from their differing time zones was more than a news event. It was their very heartbeat. But they were no longer strangers, these six. John Pope, 
a man who has explored space more than once, the quintessential astronaut, but for one thing. He is now legally separated from his wife. Because this is important. Right. Over. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Well, I hear McMahon missed his flight to Houston. That's some uh, dental it's surgery. Historic accomplishment. Get another Democrat on the next plane out. I mean, it looks like a Republican mob scene down there. And I hate seeing Nixon take all the bows. That uh, makes no difference. Everyone knows Jack Kennedy and Lyndon uh, put us in the space business. They only know what they see on that tube, period. You're more cynical than you used to be, Senator. And you're more innocent. Norman Grant, in the final year of his fourth term in the U.S. Senate, a legislator whose knack for political survival has exacted its toll, but whose moral credo is still being shaped. Penny Hardesty Pope, the connecting tissue between the other five, and in the wake of her personal travail, the most isolated. Pickly good thought. That's our home for the next couple of hours. We want to take good care of it. Leopold Strabismus, interpreter of human frailty, a man constantly on the brink of discovery. But where others reach outward, his search will plumb the human soul. I read somewhere that uh, over a billion people are watching this. Mm, which means that it can only go downhill from here, all the interest in space. <laughs> well, not if my father has anything to say about it. He doesn't, dear wife. We're talking about the public's attention span, which is notoriously short. Hey, Roy. Except in matters of their own salvation. God's hour, take one. Good morning, dear friends. And welcome to God's hour. As we celebrate this achievement, let us pause to salute those men who helped direct NASA's program. One of those in the forefront was Dr. Stanley Mott. Well, uh, actually, we always considered it kind of a group effort. On the other hand, isn't it true that even in committees, one person urges upon his colleagues the right course of action. Well, you, uh, you would think so. But, uh, Stanley Mott, the aging boy from Georgia Tech, father figure to a generation of astronauts, and yet to experience his own rites of passage. Dieter Kolf, once recruited by the Third Reich, more recently a convert to NASA, close to retirement age, but still fiercely combative. <laughs> So the world rejoiced in all 24 time zones and in a colorful spectrum of languages. Were we celebrating a technological feat, the fulfillment of an age-old dream? Or were we celebrating an irrational instinct within all of us? But while the world rejoiced, for the professionals at Canaveral and Houston, and those particularly in Washington, D.C., the moment was tinged with apprehension. Because as night follows day, elation gives way to self-doubt. Some blast! Why didn't you tell me I missed my calling like you usually do, Michael? Because we both know that you're in the right business, which is the subject of today's yeah, It only took 18 holes to get around to, Adam. Listen, Norman, Oz, I tell you what, if you concede my part, I'll do the same for you. Yours is good, Michael. You don't mind if I work for mine, do you? Okay. Let me ask you something, Norman. Have I ever thrown you a curve? You said no hustling, Michael. Okay, here's the Emma's. Party's in trouble. Party's always in trouble after losing an election. And that's where you could benefit from it. Spell it out. Just shooting fish in a barrel. We have uh, Humphrey Democrats. We have McCarthy Democrats. We have Wallace Democrats. What we need are unifying Democrats. Like Norman Grant. What who needs? Esther and Michael Glancy? I'm talking about the national ticket in 72. Now, you want me to tell them that you're not interested? No, I want you to tell me who them is. Them is the power brokers. The same people, the same group that got you onto the armed services and the foreign relations committees. Men like Ed Spector. Well, we'll see. Right now, I'm too busy trying to get money for NASA. 
Well, don't waste your time. Space is yesterday's news. Well, not to me it isn't. Well, the party leadership is divided on that question, which makes this a good time as ever to sit back and move towards center. And you might take a page out of your son-in-law's book. The carnival preacher? Well, don't kid yourself. They tell me that strabismus has lots of clout. Forget it, he's a fraud. All he does is play on the public self-doubt. You've just defined a successful politician. Michael, you're as corrupt as he is. <laughs> Granted, but a lot less powerful. So, uh, so behave yourself. Start spending more time with your wife. And who knows, if you get Potomac fever, you too can be president, my boy. Now, my friends, before we go, the United Scriptures Alliance would like to welcome 37 new stations into our fold, which brings to 204 the number of stations which now carry the word of God from our little USA. But I must remind you, the United Scriptures Alliance still relies entirely and completely upon your generous support. So please, help us. Help our little USA to continue to alert you to the activities of the secular, humanist, cynical peddlers of evolution. Okay. Help our little USA make every textbook, every teacher, every library in this country know God and how he created this world. Help every doctor who has been given the right of life and death over the unborn, help them to know God. And together, together, my friends, we can regain the of these United States of America, this USA. We can snatch it away from the men at Harvard, from Stanford, from UCLA. Together, my friends, together all of the USA can make this great USA a decent, God-fearing country. Once again. I'm here from Finish Out One. Go One. Break for the logo. Dissolve through to logo. Good. And fade to black. Good. That's a wrap. Great. It's been a mile, Rich. Thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Hey, boss, listen to this. Up five points in the overnight ratings. That increases our share to a solid 19. You know what? That makes us one of the top five religious shows in the country. That, my friends, is only the beginning. Just the beginning. Here, yeah, look at this. Oh, now, Leopold, one of these days, one of the newspapers are bound to find out that your real name is Martin Scorchella and that you're Jewish. How are you going to handle that? Just half Jewish, half Jewish. Aha, uh -huh, I can handle this exactly the way Fiorella LaGuardia handled his problem, which is exactly the same as mine. Jewish mother, Italian father. And how did he handle that? Well, uh, thank you. When he was uh, finally asked why he hid the fact that he was half Jewish, he said, well, half Jewish ain't enough to brag about. <laughs> <laughs> Leopold, people who take religion seriously will not be amused by this. Thank you, Mary Ellen. No, you're right. You're right, but I think I have the answer for that. Oh, you do? Yes, yeah, when they ask, I'll just say, yes, indeed. I was born a Jew. Just like St. Peter was born a Jew. St. James was born a Jew. Jesus Christ himself was born a Jew. But like them, I saw a better way. I saw a true way. And glory hallelujah, I became a Christian. That can be made to work. But I think it's time for us to begin our great odyssey. What odyssey was that, boss? Cut the mic, Ramirez. Yes, sir. No, we're going to go out and get ourselves in the evening news as often as we can. We're going to go state by state and get the laws of this country changed to bring God back into the textbooks. Thank you. Well, what better state to start in than the one whose senior senator is none other than my esteemed father in law. Oh, who, as you hardly need reminding, is close to the scientific community? See, that's a position that he has to start softening. The people of this country have had it, the scientific community. Look at the campus revolts. Snappy. Omnipotent. <laughs> no, no. It's time for you. Would you please? It's just this way. You got it. Thank you. It's time for your father to welcome this poor sinner into the family and transmit some of his uh, credibility. Thank you. Because uh, if he doesn't, well, we might just have to brand him for the dangerous pinko that he is. Oh, Leopold, my father's a pinko. It's all in the eye of the beholder with proper groundwork. Hey, come on. Get up. Hey. Come on. 
Well, your pants for openers, then the rest of your stuff, as soon as we get you... So am I, Clay. Yeah, well, I'd sure like to, but unfortunately, they got us listed as a two-piece set. Now, come on. Yeah. We got a meeting with the Capcom people in four hours. They've been trying to get you all morning. Now, come on. I thought I had 24 hours. Yeah? Well, orders change. What a mess. Why don't you give this poor stranger a goodbye kiss and some cab fare home? Get yourself together. Uh, Claggett, I want you to do me a favor, all right? I want you to tell me where you come off interfering in someone else's social life. I mean, you of all yeah, people. Come on. As long as you screw up your own laugh, don't mean diddly to me. As soon as your fist meets my nose, it's my business. Yeah, well, you been hearing something about me across town, huh? Oh, no, you're too smart for that. You got all the psychiatrists, everybody at NASA thinking you're A1, but I'm no different. Oh, yeah, what do you know? I know that you're just going through the motions, AC, ever since you and Penn broke up. You look like John Pope, you sound like him, but you ain't half the professional he once was. I mean, boozing and staying up all night. That's your career now. I don't need that kind of co-pilot when I'm up in space. I mean, that's suicide, man. I didn't know you cared, cowboy. <laughs> I don't, old buddy. Not anymore, I don't. Well, good. Now, why don't you just get lost? My pleasure. Adios. <laughs> Hi, Mother. Dad. I decided... We decided, Roger and I, to film this letter rather than write it. Because by the time you receive it, I, I'll, I'll be out of the country. And it's apt to be a long while before you see me again. The reason, the reason we're taking refuge in Canada is because we can't submit ourselves to fighting a war that is being fought on principles we find unacceptable. We could both register at UCLA and avoid the draft for a while. But that uh, seems a dishonest way to avoid a danger that other young men with, with less money and resources to avoid a danger that we don't have to face. In any case, I hope what I'm doing won't bring any discredit on you or the Apollo program because I... Uh, I wish it well, and I love you both very much. Okay, that's... <clears throat> Do you think this is going to hurt you when it comes out? Probably. But I'm going to keep a real low profile after uh, Apollo. You're not retiring. No, oh, ma'am. I'm not retiring. Hey, how you doing, Counselor? Not bad. But I hear you're all skin and bones these days. Is that true? Oh, don't I wish. Why don't you let this cowboy get some fiddles in you? I'll pick you up in about two hours. Well, that sounds like a good idea. Where are you calling from, anyway? Houston! Houston? <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised what you can do at Mach 2. I haven't had time to take a shower. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. Well, long time no see. Yep. <laughs> what brings you to D.C.? How is the great Earth Mother doing? Oh, old Deb is holding her own, as yeah, usual. Too. I'm just here twisting a few arms for NASA. Welcome to the club. How's it going? What do you mean, life on the hill or life after marriage? Well, on the hill I can read about. Well, I'm going it alone these days, completely alone. Now let's get to your agenda. Yeah, people are saying that the uh, moon is losing its shine, that the space program's getting buried. Oh, yes, all along the line. I mean, Vietnam's still chewing us up. They're bound to pull the plug. Unless somebody comes up with a new shine. Oh, who could that be? Some highly imaginative marine pilot, maybe? <laughs> I'd like to take the bow for the idea, but... Uh, Unfortunately, it was hatched by a Navy man. Mutual acquaintance. Oh, I see. 
I'm just here to corral our friends in the Senate to get behind it. Oh, well, it's going to take a lot more than another moon landing to attract their attention, I'll tell you. Not another. A different kind on the huh. dark side of the moon. <laughs> Andy, what are you talking about? There's no dark side. It gets just as much light as the side we see. Well, of course, <laughs> but... As long as Washington imbues it with just a little mystery, mm -hmm. the government might just get the public to support it. You know they just might? With a little uh. bit of lobbying from the prettiest member of the Bar Association. Oh, right. <laughs> now, wait, that's going to put the astronauts out of radio contact. I mean, in order to get that kind of communication, you have to have everything in the proper line of sight. I'm impressed, Counselor. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you be the moon. Excuse me. Oh, sir. Borrow a few of these. These are nectarines, guys. No, I don't need to play. Okay. Randy, I can't take you anywhere. All right, I am the moon. That's right, man. These three orbiters in position. Mm -hmm. We'll need three to assure us of constant coverage. Now, how are you going to get these nectarines into their proper orbit? Just take them up as baggage. When the computer gives the right signal, you just toss them out one by one. I see. And they're just going to stay right there? You betcha. This satellite right here be in constant communication with me and the moon's surface. This one with John in the capsule, and this one with Houston. I see. Oh, I get this. This is just another Pope and Claggett mission. Well, why not? I mean, what the heck? Keep us off the streets. <laughs> John needs something, too, I'll tell you. Why? What do you mean? Nothing. None of my business. Oh, come on. What were you going to say? You want some dessert? No, I don't. Randy, what's going on with him? I just think it. John Pope is in even deeper trouble than the space program. Oh, well, I'm supposed to be the reason for that. <laughs> you got a better one? challenged once again to reverse the trend and to rally the troops. Well, you can't expect any help from our friend Dieter here. The man's trying to talk me out of any future moonshots. Well, he must have gotten to Proxmire's group. I have never met with so much resistance on the hill to a request for NASA funds. And it is wanted, though I, I spoke with no one. Then tell me why you object to what is happening. I mean, if the committee's position is untenable, then I should know it. All NASA's trying to do is keep the space program from being dismantled. Dieter, I think you've been reading a little too much science fiction. Ah, now, Stan, if you must assuage your own guilt, then don't... Guilt over then... what? Putting a man on the moon? I'm supposed to be guilty about no, that? No, no, no. For a distorted sense of priorities. It breaks my heart to think I... I will be leaving here soon with, with everyone in retreat. How can you say our commitment to the program is a retreat? I mean, NASA has plans for Mars, for Jupiter. Yes, Capone has an extension of this country's race against Russia, as if it were some kind of Olympics. What are you saying? That all our experiments and discoveries are a game? That's all they are? they are important, and that's what upsets me. We should be building on their discoveries. All right, what would you have us do? Cancel the rest of the Apollo shots. Yes, and fire all the astronauts and assemble the brightest astrophysicists and tell them to, to get on with it. Get on with what? The universe, its, it's probable history, the, the origin of human life. Dear, you know that picture that hangs down there over my desk, Galaxy 4565? Yeah, That's yeah. 20 million light years from Earth. 
That's where this man's imagination is. So then why are you fooling around with the moon? Because my little German friend, two United States senators whom we both know, taught me when I was a very young lad that if I wanted to get anywhere in this life, I'd better drag the U.S. taxpayer along well, with this me. This is the same old argument, politics. No, he's right. We can only move one step at a time. Support this project by testifying before the Joint Committee. The next step might be more to your liking. Why do you insist now that you know my feelings? Because you're the most trusted voice in the field, the side of Van Braun. I need your help. I can't do without it. An old friend like Mott I could easily refuse, but well, who could say no to a beautiful woman? Uh, uh, I can't thank you enough, mm -hmm. really. I won't forget it. I'll be with you in a minute. Oh, well, thanks for giving me a crack at him. He's an important and effective ally. Well, you and I are on the same team. Yes, I'm glad you feel that way. I do. <laughs> when you're straight with me. Uh, when have I not been straight with you? I don't know. But I suspect that uh, maybe you didn't travel halfway across this country just to lean on an engineer. Ah, well, <laughs> no, that is not entirely why I came. John know you came? Hmm. I don't know if he'd care. Oh, yes, he'd care. Ah, uh, but do you think he'd want to see me? I doubt it. But then again, I'm the guy who doubted that you could ever turn Dieter Kolf around. <laughs> Where do you think I could find him? He's in the Valley High Motel in Canaveral this week. <sighs> Well, thanks for the bad news, Stanley. I'll see you soon. Maintenance, take a flash, hurry, maintenance. <laughs> hey, you never told me. Tell you what, that I could type? That you could write. I mean, like this, this is, this is strong stuff. Yeah, you know, it's only the first third, but I think it gives you a good idea of what I'm trying to do. Mm, give NASA fits. No. I just think people are entitled to an outsider's point of view. You know what I mean? Without all the hype. Well, you're sure giving it to him, honey. I'll tell you that. No, I just, uh, I don't think that I can risk hanging out with you anymore, I'll tell you. What do you mean? Well, what if I, uh, talk in my sleep? Oh. Well, boys like you get editorial approval. Up front. What do you mean to say that you would compromise your principles for me? And I'd compromise my grandmother for you. Would you? Well, that won't be necessary. a member of the loyal opposition. <laughs> Nixon's got plenty of those in his own party these days. Well, they seem to slow him down a bit. The latest Gallup poll has him 20 percentage points ahead of McGovern. Well, you know better than to believe in polls, don't you, Norman? Yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> My counselor bring by a few more things to be signed in triplicate. No, this is a non-legal visit. Uh, strictly social, I think you'd say. Well, it's, it's very nice. Why here? Well, look, Norman, I, we never talked about why I stopped seeing you, and I just thought that you were entitled to an explanation. There's nothing to talk about. I just figured that you had more reasons for stopping than going on. Well, yes, I suppose I did. The fact is, I missed you. I missed you, Penn. I got enough troubles with my own marriage without lousing up yours. My marriage is already lost up. Maybe so, but it is still there, isn't it, your marriage? Hmm, just by a thread. 
But it always was. It never bothered you before. Not enough to stop me. But that was then. Are you turning me down, Martin? Only until you know exactly what you want. Because I want more than just your nights next time around. I'll want it all, Penn. Then, would it be too much to ask you to invite a working girl to dinner? No. I can handle that. Well, you always drive this fast, or is this just for my benefit? I mean, it's time for some kind of journalistic analysis, like, why am I so self-destructive? Yes. Some men just work without a net. Oh, that's good, that's good. Again. Might as well turn that thing off. I don't have Claggett's gift for one-liners. Oh, you do all right. I don't know why I should be giving you an interview anyway. From what I hear, what you're writing isn't all that positive. Well, some of it is, John. I mean, mostly it's, it's very respectful. It's quite balanced, actually. Meaning we're the not-so-solid six, huh? Well, you're all humans, like the rest of us, that's all I'm saying. And if you don't want to give me your input... Then, then the report be... won't be as balanced, I suppose. Well, it won't be as complete. Not my problem. All right, it's mine. How about some off the rigor talk? It's job related, okay? Right, if those are the rules. Do you honestly think that my personal life is anyone else's business? Any more than yours or Randy's? Whoa, shake a man. Boy, you don't like me very much, do you? Does it show? Yes. I think I know why. Why? I think you're under the impression that I'm trying to break up your little game around here. What little game is that? It's the one you play with all those supersonic toys. Do you have any idea how important this space experience has been for me? I've had an education that not 20 men in the world have had. Armstrong, Aldrin, Claggett, Maybe a handful of Russians. I've seen the Earth from 100 miles up. That's important to me. So important that I traded my wife for it. So don't call it a game, all right? I'm going to be late. Sorry. Tell me that the Apollo 18 project is still in trouble. In fact, there may not be a flight to the far side. Incidentally, your sources are lousy. I'll let you be the first to know. Claggett and I have been scheduled for a February liftoff. To the far side. Wait a minute, officially? Officially. Oh, God, Pope. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, it's my pleasure to inform you that Apollo 18 will be crewed by one of the most interesting three-man teams in the history of flight. They will be introduced by a man whose name has become synonymous with the space program, Dr. Stanley Mott. Thank you, sir. Hi. Welcome to our environmental testing center. Uh, I really can't think of a more appropriate place than this for such an occasion. It's uh, right in here, in this chamber, we've been able to simulate the thermal environment of space. So let me introduce you to the three crewmen that are going to journey through space to the far side of the moon. Flight Commander Randy Claggett, United States Marine Corps. 
Command Module Pilot John Pope, United States Navy. Lunar Module Pilot Dr. Rafael Perry, Professor of Geology, University of New Mexico. <laughs> Aside from his impressive credentials, Dr. Perry has an obvious tendency to play with the gallery. Between now and the launching of Apollo 18, our three astronauts will undergo a most comprehensive training program. Because going to the far side of the moon, ladies and gentlemen, presents new challenges and new happiness. <laughs> McCarthy may not have started something, but he sure is a find it. Amen to that, Timothy. The man made a difference. This um, gets me to what's on my mind. Oh, ho, ho. Sounds like you're getting ready to launch into the weekly sermon. <laughs> no, it's, not, it's just that it's not, not easy to discuss. Uh, you know, we don't, uh, we don't talk that much anymore. On the issues, yeah, and the uh, office problems, but I, you know, uh, the overall picture. What you want, what I want. I just know it's been a long time, Senator. Now, wait a minute. Are you, are you trying to say that what you and I want are not the same thing? No, not, not philosophically. Look at those people. Look at them marching. You know why they're marching? Because they want to change change things. You think they will change anything, Tim? I think, I think they have to try, Senator. I think this is the future right here, like we were once. Do you remember that stinking lifeboat that we were in, in the Pacific? Yeah. Waiting for the rescue and sitting there? Yeah. You know what you said to me then? You said to me that every life's important. Everyone. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah, I remember that and I meant it. But do you still mean it? That's the question. Do you still mean it? You see, Senator, without leadership there, there can never be the change that we're talking about. I mean, this is... When do we want it? I always hoped you would be one of those leaders. I'm still just a country lawyer at heart, Tim. Why are you meeting with Ed Spector? Well, why shouldn't I? He works for the National Committee. Yeah, yeah, and everyone knows that uh, he's on a fishing expedition for the 72 ticket. Oh, I see, I see. You're teed off because I didn't let you in on it. You're not sure where you fit in. No, I'm not sure where you fit in. Are you a possible compromise candidate? I mean, what about Gawain Butler? All those promises? Are you going for the top spot? Senator, just I don't know. Are you a stalking a horse for something? Hold on, I just don't. Don't. Yeoman. I cannot answer those questions. Not yet. My commitments are my commitments, and I will handle them. I haven't heard that one around in a long time. Back in Washington, Ed. Hey! <laughs> I'm so sorry. You can go here for dinner. That's unfair. I'm late. Hi, Tim. Come in. I want you to meet these people, Mr. and Miss Spector. How do you do? This is Penny Coach and Jim Ford. And I believe you know these two guys. Oh, yeah. Yes, hi, Penny. How are you? Tim? Come, let's get you some chicken. Dinner. Kenny! Hello! How are you? Sounds like lobster. Well, that's absolutely incredible. How are you? Thank you. I may as well tell you, Stanley, that my husband is going to try to persuade you to bring your son into mine. Well, why do you say that, dear? I'm sure the Mott's raised Miller to express his own conscience. Oh, I wonder if you'd be so tolerant if the Vietnam War were more popular. Well, that's a good question, Norman. I know being childless makes it easier for me to be patriotic. Having a son makes it especially difficult. Well, oh, having daughters is, uh, isn't easy either, even one. Well, you've obviously done a great job there. I met Marsha at the prayer breakfast last week. She's a charmer. Oh, 
and a stubby smart and a class by himself. However, I would like to see him stick just to the Bible, wouldn't you? Well, I think it'd be fair enough to say that uh, his opinions are definitely his own. Well, they're his own, but he struck a nerve. I mean, the man is on the cover of three major magazines this week. Uh, and Tucker Thomas has us working on the cover story of our next issue. <laughs> that makes it four. And he's breakfasting with the Republicans tomorrow. Oh, I think he's gorgeous. Well, actually, he'd be a lot more gorgeous if he would uh, confine his opinions to spiritual matters and uh, stay the hell away from the sciences. Here, here. Vote for that. Well, you're getting overheated, Stanley. Don't you think he's getting overheated, Mrs. Pope? Uh, no, not that I noticed, no. Stanley's just drawing the line, Eleanor. Between what and what, Norman? Uh, Rachel, let's have a little more music. Oh, yes. 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 We yes. all gather around and sing. Oh, please, oh, you did beautifully. Oh, come on, girl. Yes. Yeah. 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 How do you regard your son-in-law, Norman? Well, are you testing my family loyalty or my politics, Ed? Well, well Sir Bismuth is an important political issue. No, not to me. He hasn't. He's just one vote. Oh, no, he's more than one vote. Now, why do you want to disassociate yourself from him? Well, we disagree on most issues. Yeah, but he's your son-in-law. He'd be a big asset. I think what Ed is trying to say is that Strabismus is family. He just wants you to meet the man and talk to him. You need him, Norman. I'll give it some thought, Ed. Well, whatever Norman decides, you can always count him in to be his own man. His own and uh, his loving constituents. My wife has an exaggerated sense of my popularity. <laughs> Only some of the voters. Why don't we go and try and find coffee? Good idea. That was wonderful. Norman might be his own man, but I'm not mine. I've got 30 minutes to get the dubs. Oh, hey, come so on, soon. Ed. Let's stay here. Wonderful party. Oh, I'm so oh, glad you got here. I love Senator. Well, thank thank you, you very much, sir. No, we loved it, though. And I'd just like to say that it's not raising a son that's the problem. It's raising one that makes you question your own conscience. <laughs> that's the problem. Good it's night. all a matter of point of view, Stanley. Nice yeah, nice Good to see night. you, Rachel. Nice so nice to see you. Miss Glancy, thank you very much, ma'am. Good night, Miss Spector. Good night. Well, Good night, everybody's dear. leaving. Question is, whom have I not offended? <laughs> Good night. Good night, dear. Well, that's always your wonderful hostess. I'll see you in the night. Good night. Congratulations, Norman. You were smashing with that specter. I guess we'll be seeing our daughter and our son-in-law more from now on. Yeah? Oh, hello, son. No, no, I, I have time to talk. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. A violinist. Uh, well, you're going to... You're going to marry her? No, no, I am... I am very happy for you. Well, you, your mother and I, we are... We are both happy for you. Well, it, 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 it seems rather sudden. But of course we will be there. Yes. Yes, I see. Well... Now you're... Well, I'm sure your mother would... Uh, rehearsal. No, I understand. You rush off. Yes. And uh, Stanley, call us back as soon as you can. Fine, yes. Fine. Goodbye. He's going to get married? He's going to get married. <laughs> well, she seems... Uh, she seems a very nice girl. And, uh, they met one week ago. And they're going to be married in two months' time at the house of her parents. And, uh, and we are invited. <laughs> oh, how nice. <laughs> that we're invited. <laughs> Stanley's getting married. <laughs> it's getting married. Doo doo. Make 
اسمم She's probably a very nice girl. And Sammy loves her. So what's the problem? Well, did I say there was a problem? Oh, Kolf, come. I know that look. Is there a problem? Well, you tell me, Lise. <laughs> the girl is Jewish. No. No, you must ask yourself, are you happier because men claim they walked upon the moon? Are your grocery bills lower? Your children better behaved? Are you safer in your home when you know that some knee-jerk liberal wants to take away your right to own a gun? No. I tell you where science has gotten us. I tell you where evolution and fossils in the rocks have gotten us into the pig pen with the other animals. Now the time has come, it is past time to vote out the humanists. Vote out the humanists and their corrupting textbooks. Vote to bring God back into our schools and into our hearts. And together, you and I can make this United States of America once again a country that God can be proud of. May it be well with you. That's fine, Reverend. Stop taking. Would you like to do a pickup of your second point, Reverend? Uh, no, Robbie, let it go out unedited. I see no need to dissemble. Of course. That's a wrap, gentlemen. Thank you for waiting. It was fascinating. Well, well, well. well. The mountain comes to more. What is the press doing here? Tucker just happened to be in the neighborhood. Tucker never happens to be anywhere. Senator, I hope you don't think I try to horn in on you. Well, what? you are, and it isn't a party, and I'd like to speak to my son-in-law without the press. Do you mind, gentlemen? Certainly. No That's more. all, boys. That's all. No more. Absolutely. Thank you. Then Tucker, kill those photos. You can absolutely count on it. Goodbye, Senator. I'm sorry. I'm glad you could come. I have been looking forward to this visit. Yeah, well, I haven't seen my daughter since the two of you are married. Well. She's expecting you for dinner. Well, I don't want her to go to any trouble. Oh, it's just no trouble at all. We have a staff. I'm not surprised. You don't resent it, do you? The fact that uh, she's living well? Why? Should I? Well, it's just that uh, I have read what you have to say about the exploitation of religion. Good. Then you won't try to convince me you believe what you say on that, too. Tell me something. Is sincerity that significant for you, personally? I'm not in the religion business. Yeah, but we're not all that dissimilar, you and I. We're both just out there hustling, you for your issues, me for God. Honestly believe you spend a little time with me, you come to accept what we have in common. Scorcella, don't misconstrue this visit. I'm here because I told my daughter I'd see her the next time I was on the coast, and that's all the endorsement you're getting from me. Well, you know, it may not be that far off before you'd be asking for an endorsement from me. That'll be the day. It's not that far-fetched. I know two men who are no longer in Congress because... because you targeted them. Targeted's a bit pejorative, isn't oh, it? Oh, but accurate. And I smell an implied threat. No, not at all. Of course, now you wouldn't want to convince me to campaign against you. It could prove fatal. It could also provide me with an issue. just a man's name, now the launching base formerly known as Canaveral. Evolution of a liftoff. Rocket design, construction, delivery to the gantry, hardware, 
computerized. But, as always, the principal element defies programming. The manpower. I have a meaning to tell you, AC. I'm moving in with Cindy Ray. Uh, uh, run that by me again. You're what? You heard me. I'm telling Dad the first chance I get. I see. What's that supposed to mean? I see. Well, I guess it means I see. It also means you have no conception of moral decency. <laughs> no conception of moral decency, huh? Well, what do I know? I'm just an old country boy. Yeah, like Cary Grant, you're an old country boy. More like a slick dissembling cobra. That's where you are. <laughs> you're that crazy about me, huh? Yeah, I think you stink. But lay something like that on me as if it was nothing. Oh, uh, by the way, I'm moving in with Cindy Ray. What kind of crap are you handing out, anyway? Who the hell are you to get on anyone's back? Look, I'm not talking about you or me. I'm talking about Debbie D. Yeah, I think about her, too. Sure. That's why you're hanging her up while you're out having your kicks. No, Deb and I, we got an understanding. Debbie D has the understanding while you're out having fun. <laughs> I'm in love. Clegg, you're always in love. What, are you going to move out for another roll in the hay? This ain't just another roll in the hay. All right. Why don't you tell Debbie D that? I'm going to tell her. I told you. Cindy and I want to get married. Hey, your sense of timing's terrific. Hey, my sense of timing's none of your business, OK? Deb. Deb, Deb. Shh. Deb. Oh, no. Come on, Deb. The movie's over. Oh, I can't believe it. No, honey, come on. I love that music. Yeah, I want you to listen to me, though. Oh. Because, uh, this is no more fun for me than it is for you. Will you please be quiet? But conscience and Randy, uh, the time factor up? make it necessary for me to be telling you. Randy, I swear. I'm going to cream you if you don't shut up. And I'm telling you this with all the love I feel. That this is, uh, I don't know, where I get off. Do you listen to me, Deb? Deb, when? You... When what, huh? When's my funeral? I'm worried. What now? I thought I recognized some more reporters out for the pool this morning asking questions. Guess that's what they get paid to do. No, no, I mean questions about some of our people. Hmm? Be generous. In my humble abode? Do you know what moral turpitude is? Something you thin paint with? Oh, that's good. And I appreciate a good sense of humor but not when undesirable elements are messing around with my boys. Papa, how old are your boys? Around 40 or so? Their age is irrelevant. These men have been handpicked to instill respect. They are role models. Role models? <laughs> yes, role models. Role models for every red-blooded, decent American kid, and don't you forget it. No, I'm going to lose control. You think it's funny? Well, I don't think it's funny. And neither will the millions of readers of my magazine. Not when they learn that the commander of America's next great space adventure is shacking up in your flea bag motel with a Japanese broad, while his wife and three kids sit in Houston, wondering when their daddy's coming home. Get your facts straight, Tucker. The lady's Korean. Well, that's no improvement. I happen to like Cindy Reed. When a good-looking woman doesn't raise hell in a bar and attracts customers, I can excuse almost anything. Well, I can't. This great smell reeks of debauchery. Look out there on that beach, filled with bimbo. Can he stop that noise? Frank, take a break. Jean-Marie, a couple of beers. Sally, we're being covered by every sleazy tabloid in the country. They're just waiting to dig up some dirt so they make a big story out of it, and I can't afford it. A scandal. America can't afford a scandal. Neither can you. Are you putting me on, Tuck? A good scandal does nothing but help a place like this. 
Not if I get NASA to declare it off limits. Then you won't have any astronauts here to track the groupies to fill up your bar. I hear you've got just about as much pull at NASA as I have. Don't push me, Sally. There are 20 ways I can get this place closed down. So you clean it up, or I'll clear it out, starting with Miss Fortune Cookie. Have I mentioned where you can stuff all this? Oh, Sally, one last thing. What if I let it be known that you're renting out rooms to hookers by the hour? You're a prince among men. Rooms 112 through 116, madam. Now, does that turn you around? No. Turns my stomach. Stanley and Margo, if I can separate you for just a moment, please. Turn and face me to receive your blessing. May the godliness of creation eternally fill your lives. May God bless you and keep you. I think on, on his wedding day, your son is entitled to more. And your daughter, too. Oh. She's a fine girl, Lizzie. She's lovely. Oh, you mean for a Jewish girl? Oh, did I didn't say that. No, no, you don't have to. Please, and come. Open yourself to these people. Open. And to this country. Remember how we have been treated here with with respect and and you, also Peter. also you, with love. Peter, because we needed you. For the wives of the scientists it was not the same. I can tell you. Thank you. Well, perhaps not, but but it, it can be if only you will allow it. So. So will you try, eh? I will try. Mother, father. Margo has a question for the both of you. Oh. Oh, what shall I call you? Mother call? Mom? I call mine by her first name. I don't care what you call me. As long as you know that you are loved. But I'm doing fine where I am. You mean like this? Yeah, what's wrong with this? Well, you're living in exile. That's what's wrong with it. Dad, I like my life. I'm starting to write a little, no, and I've got a job. You're living away from home. You're living away from America. America may not be the utopia to me that it hey, is well, to you. Who's saying anything about utopia? It happens to be my home. It also happens to be your home. That's fine for you, Dad, but I prefer to live where I don't have to suffer for my opinions. <laughs> Wait a minute, I got news for you. There's no laws in America against dissension. I'm talking about the moral climate, not the law. I'm talking about the country's constant muscle flexing, and yes, I'm talk even talking about what you do for a living. What I do? How many times have I heard you and Dieter Kolf angry about America's need to be faster, bigger, and... And better than anyone else. Isn't that what space is all about? No. Superiority? Isn't that the reason for our casualties in Vietnam? No. And isn't that the reason why Grissom and the others died working wait, wait on Apollo? Wait a second. So wait we a second. Let me the tell rest you of the world something, the bravest and most hang on a second. Let me tell you something. I'm not arguing with you that people are out there taking advantage of our ingenuity. And I'm not saying that there's no ugly Americans, because there are. 
But I got news for you, Millard. I've spent my entire adult life doing what I do for a living. And you're not about to tell me, or even try and convince me that it was for nothing. I know Gus Grissom died, and I know White and Chafee died, and I know there's others that may die during the program. Maybe even the guys going up in Apollo 18 may not come back. But that's the price you pay for living on the cutting and edge. And that's what I'm talking about. wait a second. If you're asking me what it's been like to live out there for some 40-odd years, I want to tell you it's very frustrating, all right? But it has its moments, the best of which are knowing that 12 of those men stood on the moon and came home to talk about it. And if I have had anything to do with that accomplishment, sir, I am never going to apologize to anybody for that. Dad. Little more than a week before liftoff, the Saturn V nestles in its gantry, and already the legions converge. Among the many facilities which would be more or less directly responsible for the success of Apollo 18 was the Sun Study Center in Boulder, Colorado. Its purpose? To focus the Solar Patrol Telescope with a special filter and obscuring disk to see if any flares were throwing disturbances into space. Drop the floor in place. I am, Sam. A young scientist named Sam Cottage was the assigned observer. How many times a day do they make you do this? Oh, but they don't make me do anything. It's how often I have to do it to establish trends. Mm. I still don't understand what spots on the sun have to do with some crazy taking a walk on the moon. Yeah, well, how could you? You're an English major. Hey, don't patronize me, Cottage. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know about Chaucer's use of metaphor, huh? Only that he never used it on me. <laughs> hey, you really want to learn about sunspots? Come and take a look at this. Just remember, I can't deal with things like Earth's magnetic field. Well, how about uh, there are certain sunspots that can initiate a solar flare so big then release enough radiation to be lethal. But only some spots, right? I mean, you would need a major event. Right. What you're seeing there just might be the beginning of such an event. Really? Yeah. They come in cycles. Germans say 11 years. Dr. Eddie, the head of my department, says 22. Oh. Well, then there should be no reason why we can't go to the dorm. Ronnie, look, I'm serious. I've got to go take a closer look at this on the big scope. Why? Because no matter what theory I use, I keep coming up with the fact that we're due for a major event. So why don't you talk to Dr. Eddie about it? Well, I can't. I need him for my PhD, and he'd probably laugh at me. Ah. In other words, you don't have enough fact to go on. Granted, I don't have any facts. But I've got a lot of theories. Well, I don't know why you're being so cautious with Dr. Eddie. Why don't you just tell him some of your theories? Well, I can't. He's on a field trip in New Mexico. Well, tell him when he gets back. Well, what if my hunch is valid? What if we are going to have a major event? This week, Sam, <laughs> that's preposterous. Ronnie, do you have any idea what happens when an area on the sun 50 times the size of the Earth explodes? In less than an hour, enough energy reaches the Earth to power this country for over 100 million years. And you're saying that it's dangerous? Well, normally our atmosphere protects us, but uh, if you're up real high somewhere, like in a plane, it's very dangerous. Or like the astronauts, you mean? The guys that are going up tomorrow? Deadly. Cottage. What's it gonna be? Armageddon? Or sex? How about a little of both? Come here. I know some people think that we don't put out the world's most serious magazine, but <laughs> they read us. I'll give you that, Tucker. And another thing, no one questions the accuracy of our research department. Uh -huh. I mean, it's... Oh, uh, Kathy, could we have it outside, please? I think the whole business recognizes that we have the best research department in the business. Well, this time, they have come up with a pit. Uh -huh. Listen to this, Rachel. Three days from now, that's one week before the launch of Apollo 18, mm -hmm. John and Penny Pope will be celebrating their 20th anniversary. 20th anniversary of what? 
their marriage. What else? Talk about breaks. Sure, you're aware of the fact they've been apart now for a year and a half. Uh, only geographically, as far as the public knows. And think what this does for the national interest level. World interest level. These two celebrating 20 years of marriage. Practically on the eve of mankind's greatest adventure. Are you saying you expect me to try to persuade them to fake a reunion? Rachel, they trust you. They love you. Yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about paparazzi now. I'm not going to rent Yankee Stadium. No, no, I have in mind a quiet weekend, a time for reflection. <laughs> With the photographers in attendance. Well, only now. one, only one. That's Mia Portnow, and she's the best in the She's very discreet. They won't even know she's there. Just enough to invade the privacy. Uh... Uh, no, a camera lens is not a person. That's editorializing. You know that. I don't know that. I don't know. I happen to be very fond of both of them. Rachel? I'm not asking this for me. I'm not asking it for you. I'm asking it in the name of the cause to which Stanley Mott has dedicated his life. Tucker, please. Men's progress. Think of middle America. Think of those Enough. Of leaders. Enough! I'll give it a shot. Yeah. Mm. Only because I think they really want to get back together. I do. Rachel, you won't be sorry. I already am. Wow. I can't tell you what a gas is, seeing people still together after... Wait, wait. Right there. Nice. After 20 years, it just blows my mind. Oh, well, you're ready to work at it. Oh, this is nice light. I'll get the camera. Okay, nice. Right there, I know. Uh -huh. Yeah, and in the mirror. Nice. Okay, just take your hand out of the frame. Okay. Good, yeah, okay. I mean, my parents hung in for 23 big ones, but uh, it was agony all the way. And to see someone like you and your husband, you know, from the pictures I've seen, he's mm -hmm. got a lot of Monty Clift in him, uh -huh. around the jawline. You think so? Yeah. Well, that was my mind. <clears throat> uh, you want to come over here on the couch? Oh, fine. <clears throat> yeah, that'll be nice. Are you, uh, into a long-term relationship yourself? <laughs> <laughs> you got to be kidding. <laughs> Two weeks and out. <sighs> Working for Tucker Thompson, I'm in a different city every week. Mm. But you'd be surprised how involved you can get with different guys. Oh, yes, in two weeks? Absolutely. It's like uh, going off to war every time. Very intense. You want to move the flowers off the frame there? You're so beautiful. Oh, that's <sighs> nice. Thank you. I don't feel very beautiful, to tell you the truth. Yeah, well, would I lie to you? Yes, I think you would, yes. Just a minute. Go on, you look gorgeous. I won't take any more pictures. Thank you. Hello? Hi. Uh, his things go in the room there, uh, in the closet on the right. You look great. You look good, too. I lied. Mia. Mia Portnoy. Portnow. Portnow. This is my husband, John Pope. Hi. Do? Uh, do you mind uh, coming in again, and I'll get a few more shots of you, and then I'll get you at the theater? Why not? Great. <clears throat> Nice, that's great. Another kiss, please. Good, and looking at each other. Nice. See you at the theater. So long. Did I keep my word or not? Ten minutes and I'm out of here. <laughs> you are a paragon of truth. <laughs> hey, just for the record, that guy in there owes nothing to Monty Clift or anyone else for that matter. I mean, I really had a hard time keeping my hands off of him. I know what you mean. You know? I've never scored with an older guy. Uh, he's not that old. Oh? Don't give me ideas. Mm, bye. She's quite a bundle. Mm, she's sweet. She's also very funny. Thank you. Well, to... 
Whatever. Whatever. That's a good year. Mm, that's fine. I meant for us. 1951. Yes, it was. I mean, that's what this is all about, isn't it? Our 20th. Oh, yes. It's the public relations event of the month. <laughs> Look, why don't we just cut to the chase, huh? It's a wacky idea that Thomas had, but I'm kind of glad he came up with it. Yes. Gives me a chance to straighten a few things out. What do you mean by things? Things that happened between us that were never resolved. Our divorce, for example. We might want to deal with that before the launch date. You know, if it hadn't been for Rachel, I don't think I would have gone through this thing at all. She's a hard one to say no to. Mm. Listen, uh, reason I came down here was to let you know that I'm prepared to sign the papers, if that's what you want. You can hold them in escrow, whatever they call it, just in case. I think the flight's going to be a successful one, John. Yeah, I think so, too, but you never know. Well, look, let's at least go through the motions of enjoying this weekend. I am enjoying it. That's good. Those damn stars. Why'd they have to come between us? That's not what came between us. Look, whatever you did, I'm not going to blame you for it. You were entitled to a life. You still are. Oh, I've missed you, John. Boys will be in isolation tomorrow. Oh, they'll be fine. Uh, by the way, I was uh, delighted to hear that you and Commander Pope and I mean everything's fine. Yes, thank you, Mr. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please let the lady through. Have some manners. You wouldn't mind later on uh, doing a photo session with our Mr. You never stop, Mr. Thomas. I can't now. I'm late for an appointment with Cindy Reed. Is she inside? Unfortunately. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please, how about some humanity? Give the lady a break. Could you turn around and give us one yeah, take one? Sorry, I'm late. Oh, I see that. Could you all just leave us for a while, please? Now, for one thing. Please, leave us later. Jean-Marie, get these bozos out of here. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Ladies, let's go. Want a drink? No, thanks. It's too early in the morning for me. Thank you for showing up. Amy's a lot to me. Not at all. What's on your mind? This one, tell you. Sorry I am that we lost touch with each other. Oh, well, we're both very busy. Two working girls. No, I don't think that's why. I think you probably feel a little sorry for Debbie Claggett. Well, I do, yes. I feel very badly for her. Well, just for the record, so do I. And I'm just as anxious about this launch as the two of you are. I'm sure you are. 
You know, it wasn't supposed to happen like this between Randy and me. I didn't plan it that way. In fact, uh, I wasn't ready for it at that point in my life. He's my anchor. He's become my anchor. I never had anyone else to be responsible to before him. Oh, I think you can handle that. I do love him. I guess I just wanted to share that with you. Well, I'm glad you did, Cindy. At exactly 419 this morning, a monument to man's ingenuity stands at launch pad A at Cape Kennedy, housed in its gantry, awaiting its historical thrust to the remote side of the moon. <laughs> What's the matter? It's a good warm-up, Dr. Mott. Only relax a little more when we actually shoot it. What do you mean, relax? You mean be more conversational? Exactly. How about, uh, and that's the way it is. Is that good? <laughs> is that too much like Walter Cronkite? Have no fear of that, Dr. Mott. Pick it up in a half hour, dress rehearsal. Not bad. She not didn't bad. like me. She did not like me. Monument to man's ingenuity, eh? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> about today, though, it's a hell of a day. Oh. Even you'll admit that, won't you? I do. I do. But you know, Stanley, it could have been an even better one. You're at it again. You're carping. Yeah, of course. Here we are going to the moon again. When, uh, when, well, we could have been going to Saturn, Mars, or well, you name it. Of course, of course. You know something, my friend? You are about the only diversion I have that keeps me from thinking about my son. Well, we all need diversions. So, how are we going to explain all this to... 91 million people. Very slowly. Morning. The great day. Six million pounds of machine. 36 stories tall. Nearly 10 years work of half a million people. Through the night it was checklisted, double checked, electronically monitored, computerized, televised, dehumanized nice of process. human error. While the night of celebration was ending, the day began for the astronauts. Breakfast, medical examination, suiting up. 6.32 a.m., three hours before launch on pad 39A, Claggett and Perry walked on the surface of the Earth. Their next steps would be on the far side of the moon. Is there a movie on this flight? Only in first class, buddy. Firing command enabled. Firing command enabled. Checking hydraulics. We have the firing command. We are now on the automatic sequence. Of the tank. Oh, yeah. This is better than me taking a ride at Disneyland. Yeah. Why am I shaking? Hey, fellas, uh, don't lock that. I might want to chicken out. You're out of luck, buddy. You're coming with us. We're now approaching the T minus one minute mark. T minus one minute. T minus one minute and counting. Now in the final minute of our countdown, at the 30 second mark, swing arm number one will retract. T minus 50 seconds as we pass the T minus 50 second mark, the power transfer takes place. First stage, second stage, third stage, and the instrument unit going to internal power. T minus 37 seconds and our count continues to go well. We'll be looking for an ignition of those five first stage engines at the T minus 8.9 second mark. First stage propellant tanks have been pressurized. Spacecraft Commander Randy Claggett now performing his final function by pressing the button to align the guidance and control system of the spacecraft. Coming up on 30. Mark. T minus 30 seconds and counting. T minus 30. 
25 seconds and counting. We are still proceeding. T minus 20. 17 seconds. One arm back. We have guidance internal. 10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 18. three minutes, the huge stage one has discarded its obligation, lifting its massive 6,300,000 pounds eight miles straight up from Earth, thus rendering it useless. Now, we have to discard stage one before we're ever even able to fire stage two. So how is stage one discarded? Well, actually, as if uh, we were to perform a giant pyrotechnic event in space. Roger. Good thrust on the S-4B. We're ready for staging. With 600 automatic relays blowing stage one away and letting it fall harmlessly into the Atlantic. Roger. 18, Houston. Everything is looking perfect. Perfect cutoff time, 11 plus three. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, then what happens? Oh, well, let, let me show you. So, now you, you lose all this, and you are left with stage two. Now, when it's, uh, when it's five J2 rockets fire, that causes it to leap from an altitude of eight miles to a majestic 112 miles. gave way to landing parties, while astronauts Claggett, Pope, and Perry found their way across the sea of space, following the same stars that guided Columbus to shores unknown. 92.5 by 106. Roger. They're looking at our go, no-go parameters for translunar injection. Roger, we read 25,862 feet per second. 
with an altitude of 119.6 miles. The booster is confirmed for orbit. Over. Any glitches? Uh, none whatever. It looks like smooth sailing. You're telling me we actually took off? <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to liven things up for you, yeah, Doctor. Randy, we'll fire at 2 plus 3, 8 plus 4, 6, which will put you on your proper TLI trajectory. Roger. Now, can we take off these monkey suits? Yes, Doctor, you've been a good boy. Dr. Pomfret, it's that same region, 419. You still think it's maintaining its horseshoe configuration? Yes, sir, I do, but that's not the problem. The problem is there's a sunspot forming. You can almost see it with the naked eye. Well, it's still no indication the solar proton might erupt. Granted. Well, and what's the problem? Do you have any figures to support what you're suggesting? No, sir, it's just a feeling. Enough of a one to warrant an alert, Cottage? No. Yes, now. Hmm. What you're viewing is a simulation of the jettisoning of stage three, as it happened with Apollo 18 in space just, just a moment ago. Mrs. Pope. Now, I'm afraid she's checked out. Oh, oh there she is. Uh, just a moment. Mrs. Pope. Oh, thank you. Satellites are in orbit and are functioning. Flight dynamics officer reported that the results of the landmark track. Oh, hello, Norman. Now you just caught me going out the door. Yeah, well, Tim told me you were on your way down to Houston, and I just wanted to call and wish you and John good luck. Well, thank you, Norma. For everything. Are you going back to him? Oh, I can't answer that yet. I'm not sure whether it has anything to do with you or with us. But just for the record, Norman, I'll never forget what we had together. Get on with your life, Pen. Bye, Bye, Penny. Now try singing it. <laughs> <laughs> Mustard and mail? Yes, yes, yes. With the pickle on rye. So I had him leave off the pastrami this time. He'd have slept alone for a week. <laughs> so what'd you find? Well, region 419 is transiting from the eastern half of the sun to the western half. That's a big problem. Why is that a problem? Well, because the paths traveled by atomic particles are curved. Therefore, the ones leaving from the western half are more directly channeled and focused on the Earth and Moon. What do you mean? There's more? Yeah. Travel time for the deadly particles from the western half is much shorter than those from the eastern half. So you mean if the astronauts were ever to get caught up there, they'd have less time to seek shelter? Yeah, you got it. The thing is, it's, it's a quiet sun. Region 419 is transiting from east to west nice and smoothly. Well, then why are you still so jittery? Because I believe that before cycle 20 is out, we're going to have a big bang. Wow. Well, lucky for the guys up in Apollo that it skips us this time. Why? Are they on the moon yet? Mm -mm. No, not yet, but I heard the broadcast from Houston, and they are on their way down. Take a look at this. Wow, fellas, let me take a look oh. at that. Hey, what a sight, huh? That's 
That's incredible. You'd rather not tell us about it? Well, it sure looks different from the other side. In what way, John? Can you describe it for us? I'll let our resident geologist handle that. Well, for one thing, we don't see the vast area of Mare surface, and the hills look, well, rather hummocky. Can you see the landing site? Yeah, the landing site is still in darkness. But what we can see of the weather there is a sure reassuring. Yeah, but it's very different than from the Earth's side. There's many, many more craters. Still no glitches? There they were. Now, my fingers are crossed, but so far, this has been one perfectile mission. This is Apollo Control. We're coming up now on 20 minutes until ignition for the power descent. The landing point for Apollo 18, a plain area boxed in by mountains on one side, actually on two sides, and a rail on the third side. We'll uh, put Luna down about four miles from the Gagarin crater. Yeah, one thing I noted, uh, starting up right in the command module and uh, heading down in the limb, there's uh, a little bit of an orientational change that uh, we all been through in the water tank, and it, it still feels pretty unusual. I find myself uh, nearly standing with my head on the floor when I get down inside the lamp. Well, of course, we are all familiar with this, the near or Earth side of the moon. Well, it's been mapped for the last 300 years. Well, I'm sure you grammar school children out there have studied it too. But only by studying Russian and American photographs of this, the far side of the moon, have scientists been able to find out anything at all about this? Here, Luna's chosen landing spot. Get ready, Randy. We are 10 seconds from undocking. Roger, good buddy. We're all set to go. Separation burn. There he goes. You're looking good, Lena. And here we go. Okay, Dick, we're out at 11,009. Roger. Okay, stand by for pitch over. There it is. You're looking good, Lena. seconds. Too busy to talk now. We're drifting to the left. Too much. No strain. I see it dead ahead. Level off. I can't see a damn thing. We're tilted. We are tilted left. Five degrees. Uh, I thought so. A little forward velocity. Yeah, that's better. Houston, I can see it now. Very little down. 40 feet going down at three. I have hit 30 feet. Touchdown. Down four feet per second. Feels good. Twenty feet. Roger. I have you ten feet. Down two feet per second. Stand by. of the following morning, while Sam Cottage waited for the blazing appearance of the sun, 
He thought of himself as an ancient Aztec priest on the highest altar, waiting in darkness for the return of the life giver. But if he were looking for some definitive response to his gnawing doubts, all he was able to draw from the new day's first glimpse was a gut instinct that he might have to issue an alert. And in the physical sciences, those instincts are, as often as not, insufficient cause. Houston, the hatch is open. I'm getting ready to lay the lamp. I'm Luna Houston, Roger. We copy. All right, now. I'm standing out here on the porch. Get ready to deploy the mason. Luna Houston, uh, we're still with you, Roger. I'm stepping off the porch now. Making my way down the ladder. It sure is bright on the dark side of the moon. Macy, have you spotted us yet? Working on it. Now we seem to have landed in a spot with a few three meter craters. I'm about to jump onto the footpad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as I step out to Gagarin Base, I'd like to dedicate this first step on the far side of the moon to all those who made this possible. <laughs> this is fantastic. <laughs> You look pretty agile over there, Twinkle Toes. You bet your uh, <laughs> life I am. Uh, happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. <laughs> oh. See, we do windows too. <laughs> Happy trails to you until we meet again. Roy Rogers never wrote this kind of rage. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Houston, I don't know if the folks at home are going to get any of this transmitted to them, but better explain it. We have not put heavy starch into old glory. It just looks that way because there's no wind up here. You see it back there? Oh. <laughs> Dr. Mott, we seem to have lost video contact with the lunar module. Oh, that's Could... actually only temporary. It's uh, because we're switching satellites. Could you explain to us what's going on on the lunar surface right now? Sure. I'd be glad to. Uh, Dieter, uh, don't we have a lunar vehicle card yeah, yet? Yes, right here. Well, now, this is actually uh, what's going on on the moon right now. Our astronauts are going to have to take a taxi over to the crater. So uh, right about now, the astronaut should be uh, lowering the lunar vehicle down onto the ground. The front wheels here will hit the ground, and then they'll lock into place. Now he'll lower the back end down. Those wheels will hit the ground, and they'll lock into place. Now the vehicle is parallel with the ground. Uh, with his hands, he manually pulls up the console. He gets in. The other astronaut goes around the side. He gets in. He'll flip the switches, and they'll motor along at about 17 kilometers an hour for their little cab ride over to the crater. Oh, uh, damn. I got some wires crossed. I got it ass backwards. <laughs> We're working uh, with an open mic, Randy. Uh, be careful. Uh oh. I apologize, TV viewers everywhere. A man who stands this close to heaven should watch his language. Randy, we'll uh, try and use the westernmost satellite. We calculate it to be about uh, 30 degrees above the western horizon. Roger, 30 degrees. As soon as you get the. Uh... Else place. We'll start on Traverse 1 to the reticulated crater. Roger. Are you checking your uh, dosimeters? Regulare. He means regular. <laughs> Roger. Uh, Randy, uh, hit that 30 degrees right on. We have a good lock on the satellite. Roger. Okay. 
That's a great shot. Thank you very much. But before we go, I got to tell you about a rock. It's right out at uh, 12 o'clock. Right almost at the radar antenna shadow. Roger, we show you starting your traverse. Uh, there's a fairly high crater density around, and uh, as I mentioned, they change up to probably uh, 10, uh, 10, 8, 10 meters or so. Uh, and in our local area, uh, let me give you a rough count of uh, oh, the uh, 8 to 10 meter ones. I have, I guess, every uh, 15 to 20 meters, so that there's a fair number of medium craters. Just are all smart. Okay. okay, let me photograph this for you, and I'm gonna document the sample. Okay. Put this on your finger. <laughs> Almost Texas size. Now, this is a sample of the red rock. It's going in bag 117. And it'll be coming home to Lunar Express. Copy that, Houston? Roger, bag 117. Dr. Pompert, you better have a look. Region 419? Yes. It's reached the precise spot from which it creates maximum danger. You're well, right, it's crossed the midline. Still close enough to deliver a powerful shot. However, we must still consider 419 to be relatively quiescent. Quiescent? We must be looking at different suns. Region 419 is now 63 times the entire surface of the Earth. Are you positive? I'm very positive. In fact, I'm so positive. Good God, please protect those men. What are you doing? I'm calling Houston. Region 419's exploding. Hello, Luna. Houston, over. Luna, Houston, over. 
Hand it over to Ghost Tone Tracking. Maybe they can cut through this crap. Now, uh, Luna, this is Houston. Uh, do you read me over? Yeah, where's Ghost Tone? Hello, oh, out there, Houston. Do you read me over? Yes, I read. Houston. Uh, Roger, uh, we seem to be getting a lot of solar fire activity, John, and we've lost communication with Luna. Is there a chance? Houston? This is Luna, do you read me? Good. Roger, Luna, I read you. We lost you there for a while, Randy. What's happening? Roger, it seems to have been a solar event on the sun. Uh, have you checked your dosimeters? Uh-oh. We read your telemetry is very high. It's not a way. The cemetery is saturated. Confirm here, too, Houston. Very high. We have confirmation from different sources. A major solar event, classification 4 bright, X9 in X-ray flux. The probable duration. Get up, predict. Stand by. Two or three days. Now, Roger, Dr. Feldman says two or three days. Looks like we've got a problem, Houston. Uh, the drill is clear. Return to the lamp. Prepare for liftoff as soon as... I have data for liftoff or running. Roger, Luna. We will try to get a computer load up to you. What is your ETA back at the lamp? Yeah. Distance, 11 kilometers. Top speed, 10 clicks. Field, uh, just over an hour. Uh, Houston, oh, this is all clear. Would you like me to descend to rendezvous orbit? Stand by, John. Roger. We'll go. Repeat, how long did button up, Luna? gear in 20 minutes. Roger. Abandon all gear, Luna. There is no panic, but speed is a sample. I want to get one more sample, Randy. Hey! Oh. 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 Randy! Hold on, buddy. Uh, Luna, this is Houston. Do you read me, over? Come on. Luna, Houston, over. Uh, Luna, this is Houston. Do you read me? Over. Hey, uh, partner. Oh. Uh, Luna, oh. what happened? Maintain safe speed. Roger, it's a go at 15. Well, then, uh, Dr. Mott says 17 was tested safely at Ames and proved uh, satisfactory. Thanks, Stanley. 17 is. Houston, everything's looking good. Okay, Houston. We're galloping along at 17. Looking real good. Traffic ability up to the northern complex. Looks the same. We've started the living and we're wrecking to Everything's looking good. More than 5,000 rams are striking the moon. Give us the bottom line. Highest rating was 5,830 rams. Absolutely fatal. If, and I repeat, if 5,830 strike a naked man, he's dead. Our men have the finest suits ever devised. Enormous protection. Still, it's not the radiation that might kill them. And what? They yeah, would throw protons from the sun, and those won't reach the moon for another 50 minutes. So, we rush our men into the moon lander where they will find more protection, then we rocket them up to the command module with its heavy shield. Well, we can save them. Yeah. If we're going to succeed down here, there can't be any hysteria at this end. No fluctuation in voice, Dick. I want all ideas, and I want them quick. <laughs> How bad is it? No 
I'll find out, Stanley. Please, Stanley, please. Hey, Raph, buddy. Man, I have absorbed large doses of this, haven't I? Every day in dentist's offices. <laughs> Those lead blankets they throw over you doing again? Let me put it this way. I'd swap this jalopy for one right now. We seem to have some technical difficulty with our live transmission from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. We'll resume coverage of that event as soon as we resolve the difficulties. Meanwhile, we have our reporter Jim Stanley standing by. Jim, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, Frank. What's going on down there in Houston, Jim? Well, uh, we're not uh, uh, precisely sure right now. I'm standing outside Mission Control, and there seems to be a lot of activity. Uh, yeah. As I say, we don't know what's happening. The public affairs uh, director has uh, yeah. stopped giving us a minute report. Sure. Now, that that Houston? I just talked to Mark. It's serious. There's been a huge explosion on the sun. They're being bombarded by mega doses of radiation. It might not come back. Damn those men. Jim, is there any official word on the status of Apollo 18 itself? Well, no, not They cut the live feed from Houston on the network. Is Penny Pope in Houston? I'm trying to reach you. Can't get through. But she must be going through. Altair, have you cranked in the data we sent? Affirmative. Uh, you have the drill on turning the command module around so the uh, heat shield faces the sun. Also affirmative. Execute immediately. Will do. What is your dosimeter reading now? Same as before. Excellent. Your reading is much lower than Luna. You're going to be all right, John. Roger. This is Houston, Luna. All readings are good. Good to hear that old whiskey voice of yours, Dick. We can see the module. ETA 15 minutes. I'll read liftoff data as soon as you're inside. Ferry here. We have terrific rock samples. Appreciate it, but if transfer takes even one extra minute, abandon. We won't have to. Right there. Can I talk to the crew? Uh, go ahead, Doc. Uh, Mark Feldman, Rob. Uh, is your voice sort of drying up? Affirmative. Heard it that you swallow spit. Fresh out of spit. Is that orange juice? Keep your mouth moist. Mouth. Be moist. Hello, Luna. This is Houston. Over. Hello, Luna. Houston. You still read me? Over. We read you, Houston. Uh, Roger, Randy. Uh, the moment you uh, step in the lunar module, we'll start our anytime liftoff procedures. Make sure you follow the checklist. <laughs> All right, Houston. I always have been one of the world's great checkers. Check this, check that. I ain't gonna stop now. Oh. Oh, we're getting there now. Oh, boy. Uh-oh. Are you okay, Ralph? Tom, oh, so oh. we back to Ralph. Just a little boy. Make it up the ladder? He doesn't know. He doesn't know? Raph, you with me? Okay, buddy. Come on now. Just a little bit. More. Oh, gee. So this is a cowboy's life. Oh, oh something fell. Let us have this. I can't go back down for it. I got it now. 
I think Dr. Perry's fainted. Drag him in, secure all, and lift off immediately. Roger, Houston. He's in. He can do wonders with the moon's gravity. Lift off immediately. All right. Hang tight, Ralph. Have him home in a minute. Lift off immediately. Um, I'm going to use runway 27. There's not a hell of a lot of traffic on it. Uh, I guess not. You ready up there, Icy? Yeah. Three orbits ought to do it. Here we come. Set propulsion system. Go. Set battery. Set battery is looking good. Yeah, low computers, primary navigation system. Randy pings is out. Go to a port guidance system. Roger, Axe. Axe put me in the port stage. We're out of here. All readings are correct. One hell of a job, Randy. Uh, Read me, Randy. Luna, Houston, over. Luna, Houston, over. Hello, Luna, this is Houston, over. That's right, damn it. Luna, Houston, over. Luna, come in. Hello, Luna. This is Houston. Do you read me? Over. Houston. Houston. I, I feel faint. Not now, Randy. Not now. Listen, Randy. Hold the control very tight. Oh. Houston. It won't work. I, I... Raph has got into V-fib. Randy's in V-tac. Colonel Claggett, hold tight. You must not let go. I repeat, you must not let go. Hold on, Randy. Oh, it won't work, Houston. Let go. Location? Um, uh, east of, uh, east of the Gagarin crater. Tell him to get the hell out of there and bring it on home. Uh, John Houston, let's prepare for TEI. Altair, Houston, over. Doc? His EKG's fine. John, this is flight. You must prepare for trans-Earth injection. John, do you read?
Altair. Houston, this is Altair. Come in, please. Ready. All the way home, John Pope listened to cassettes. Not his own Sibelius recordings, but to Randy Claggett's tapes. And to his astonishment, he found himself enjoying country music. Roger Houston, I copy. Uh, you never look better, Moonshiner. Got my fingers crossed. Roger, entry interface in 10 seconds. This is your day, John. Fire on home. I intend to. Sings out a song which is soft, but it's clear. Is it me? Exactly where I intended. Where we intended to. Lousy break. I'd say so, Michael. They were two good men. Well, as they say where I come from, you get nothing for nothing. Yeah. But what a price they get. Rubber the green. Now, Mike, I asked you to come to the committee meeting early because I told you I'd get back to you on that uh, the business matter. Oh, well, what's to get back? I mean, the man is your son-in-law. He's also one of the most popular ministers in the country. Why shouldn't he give that eulogy tomorrow? Because if we let him, he'll not only bury those two men, he'll bury the space program right along with him. He could be right. Like hell he is. And I'm against giving him another platform. You just got through admitting how high the price was. But what's the price when you stop reaching out? Well, be practical, Norman. The man's influence goes beyond the church. That's exactly why I'm opposed to his appearance at Arlington. Well, he wants the job, so reconsider. And you'll keep taking care of me, right, Michael? You're not doing too badly, son, are you? No, no, I'm doing pretty well. I'm still playing golf at Burning Tree. What's the problem? The problem is, there's a lot of problems. The more I keep looking the other way, the easier my life gets. Well, who knows if I kept this up? You might end up on the ticket one of these days. Huh? Ed Spector told me himself that if you moved just a little towards center... Yeah, well, I wouldn't you would put have... too much stock on what any of that bunch has to say. Between you, me, and the lamppost, I'm with you. But let's face it, Norman. Politics means getting elected. Certainly been doing that well enough. But I'm going to tell you, Michael, it's starting to rankle. Winning? No, looking the other way. Like supporting the administration on Vietnam when really my heart is with McGovern. <laughs> Hell spells, Norman. Half the fathers in the Senate feel that way, but don't mean you vote that way. If you want to keep your membership in the club, you mean. You got it. What if I'm losing my interest in the club? Don't muck with success, Norman. Nobody will like you. The problem is right now, I don't like me. You're suffering from survivor's guilt because they're not coming home and you're still alive. No, no, Michael, listen to me. Just listen. I'm telling you this because you matter to me. You brought me right along in that well down there, and I'm grateful to you. But don't tell them my vote anymore unless I feel it. Not starting with the black issue in the space program. You made every effort. No, 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 no. I made you a token made every... effort. I have made a token effort. I let it slide because my state caucus shies away from racial controversy. Well, I made a commitment, damn it, and I'm going to keep that commitment. If I stay on this committee, we go on record. 
You know what, son? You keep talking like that, you'll be running for dog catcher in Clay County. That's all the support you get from me or the party. Uh, maybe so. If you're right, Michael, I can always switch parties. What about Wayne Morris? Hanging by his fingernails. That's what he is. But on his own terms. Stop the meeting without me. Just remember me on election day, madam. Oh, I told you years ago, Senator, you'll always have my book. While Apollo 18 was unable to fully accomplish its mission in space, it managed to achieve something uniquely satisfying here on Earth. For one sweet and touching moment, it brought people together. You know, mankind was born of matter that accreted in space. Some of us believed that we were meant to explore space, to probe its secrets. I'd like to say to Doris Perry, your husband was coming home with some of those secrets. He was a great pilot, great man, and an even greater friend. Now, at times like these, we're tempted to find the symbolic implications of a man's life. But Randy Claggett was no symbol. He was flesh and blood and very real. To me, he was the quintessential pilot. He flew more hours in space than any man I know, and I had the great privilege of observing him from close range. He treated a spacecraft as if he owned it. Once, as we were preparing for a long-duration flight, he said to me, Well, buddy, let's see if we can fly this bucket of bolts. Well, let me tell you, Randy Claggett, you flew it just fine. journey from west to east, forever producing night and day. And if we could watch from space and look godlike into the years ahead, we might glimpse some of the sights that Claggett and Perry were denied. The austere calm of the Martian landscape, the transparency of Saturn's rings, the pleasure of woman's initial foray into that all-male domain, and equally overdue, an end to the racial discrimination within the program. And we would also see all those things